Hi everybody, Golden Era Bookworm here. Today we begin with the new series of interviews with Ken Sprague, who was an American bodybuilder, model, and owner of Gold's Gym, and of course, well known for his work as Dakota in the porn industry. In this series, we will explore the man Ken Sprague, whom if it weren't for his efforts, we wouldn't have Gold's Gym and perhaps the bodybuilding culture as it is today would have never developed to the extent that it did. As you will learn, Ken Sprague has led a rather extraordinary life, and in this series we hope to clarify the truth behind Ken Sprague, Dakota, and the acquisition of Gold's Gym, and his influence in bodybuilding. In this first interview, we will look at the early life of Ken Sprague, his family, his education, his first marriage, as all these influences would lead him to make decisions that would change the trajectory of his own life and that of bodybuilding forever. Enjoy. Well, uh, hi, Ken. Um, it's a great pleasure <laughs> to have you on my channel. And uh, I greatly appreciate you agreeing to be interviewed. Uh, welcome. <laughs> I fully agree, and I'm so happy to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you also for sending me some of the photos of your own personal collection, articles, which I have read everything. Oh, uh, good. Yeah. And I think it's, um, having done so, uh, besides basing a lot of the questions I have today, um, and I don't know whether we're going to cover all of them because I've got close to 40 okay. questions. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, you have, having read that, I, I realize you've read, you've led a rather extraordinary life um, so far. And it's really impressive to have read uh, everything you sent me because in all honesty um, I didn't know you had such a variety of talents and achievements and academic awards and for most people I would say that um, and by that I mean bodybuilding community I don't think they know that side of you um, and they probably just know a limited part of your life so I think it's going to be interesting to talk about those things too. Good I hope it is yeah I suspect you're right they know very little about me other than that seven years at gold's gym yes <laughs> and a few rumors as you put them etc yeah. <laughs> those are the easiest to generate <laughs> yes uh so um i guess i'll start with some questions is that correct mm -hmm. is that fine yeah that's great all righty okay so the first topic obviously i want to cover is um starting off with an introduction about yourself like your early life your education and your first marriage um, can you start by talking about your early childhood and when and where you were born? Things like that. Sure. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1945. So that makes me 78 this year. <laughs> I'd rather have 10 years or so off that, but it is what it is. <laughs> well, congratulations yeah. on, on reaching that uh, reaching. maturity. No, there <laughs> were times I know when I was... Uh, in my teens, I thought by the time you're 30, you're finished. <laughs> <laughs> but it's thankfully it wasn't that way. But anyway, I grew up in Cincinnati, went to uh, public schools, mm -hmm. and to try to integrate the total picture, I uh, did fine as a student. I was um, went. Interestingly, I know that since you read some of the articles, I went to an all-white middle, middle school. Mm -hmm. And then in high school, I went to a, a essentially all-black high school. There were 962 African-Americans and seven Caucasians. Oh, man. No, yeah, no uh, Hispanics and uh, no Asians. It was really marked like that. But that was a response to... Um, segregation at the time, neighborhood segregation and the whole bit in which segregated schools. But I knew that this, I'll say black high school was a better place for athletics. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, it, they won every year in track and field and basketball. And so that's what really inspired me to go there when I left middle school to high school, mm -hmm. rather than what they called the smart school that you had to take a, uh, test to get into okay. so that's um that's sort of my trend in education although i had a much better education from my 
two older brothers. Uh, one, as a matter of fact, the one that got me involved in weight training, 13 years old. A lot, candidly, to him growing up. When I was 10 years old, he took me to the gym. And from that point on, I was a weight trainer. And they also watched me educationally. Like, oldest brother is a physicist. Mm -hmm. And uh, the youngest brother that I mentioned is the mathematician. And they sort of watched over me. My mother didn't have much, <laughs> much interest, candidly. <laughs> but uh, the two older brothers kept an eye on me, kept educating me. Uh, learned a lot more in, from them than I did in regular educational venues. And then later, when I owned gold, speaking of education, I would simultaneously went to law school okay. after going to the University of Cincinnati for my undergraduate on a track and field scholarship. And then much later, I got uh, several more degrees in biology, uh, chemistry, paleontology, nice. and, uh, beha <laughs> and behavior disorders, which is an interesting one. And I related that to my time at Gold. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure you ran across a lot of different behaviors. <laughs> oh, you did. You really did. Some of them, you know, they're fun, really. I always took it as fun. Some of the antics that went on in Gold. But my, I, uh, the high school I went to, to broaden the que your question to your, your inquiry, hmm. uh, all black, essentially. And so... What would my friends at school become? Black. And uh, I met this young lady. I think there were two white females in the school, and that was it. And naturally, I met a young woman, African America, on the football bus going to a game. And one thing led to another. And one of the others was it got me expelled from high school. So mm -hmm. I never graduated from high school, but went on to college anyway. I, I did well in tests. And then later to law school and much later other avenues of, of uh, education. Um, you've mentioned your two older brothers, um, but um, you also wrote in, I believe, in one of your emails today that um, at one point you were, uh, you were all ballet dancers. Oh, yeah. It sounds, where that generated from? My mother was a ballet dancer. She really wanted to be a performer and she was not good enough. <laughs> but uh, she had my brother start ballet at the same studio. And then, of course, when I was five, I got pulled into the deal. Okay. <laughs> Somehow my oldest brother said no. <laughs> That's another story. But when I got to be 13, if you can imagine, I, I'm a, I was about 6'2". Thin, really wire thin with these size 14 feet. And so uh, to me, I looked just preposterous. So <laughs> I, I gave it up at, at around 13 years old. But would you say that was it ballet then or really your older brothers that kind of directed you or at least your destiny into sports? I think it was a combination that uh, ballet candidly helps. It really helps footwork, explosiveness, and all the things you need in the average um, athletic pursuit and a balance, the whole works. Mm. But at the same time, I guess my brother had me at the Y lifting weights and I loved basketball. I was, I turned down scholarships later to, for basketball in lieu of track and field. I took a track and field scholarship to uh, start uh, at the University of Cincinnati. Okay. So um, you've talked about Taft Information Technology High School, um, how I guess the fact that you got into sports really influenced you getting into there, how you met your then your first wife. Mm -hmm. um, I believe her name was uh, Melrose. Is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. Mm -hmm. um, now, was the fact that you were within this school um, what actually um, influenced you to join that civil rights movement and attend the march? 
on Washington uh, for the Jobs and Freedom uh, during August of 1963. Was was that the influence, the fact that you were within the school and seeing now really opening your eyes to um, the segregation issues in America at the time? You know, uh, candidly, I really, my eyes weren't opened. Uh, it was not me to be prejudiced. I, I'm certain that I wasn't. You know, people say, uh, you don't really know, but, but my friends were black, white, what, neighborhood white, school <laughs> black, because the two were segregated. Mm. But uh, these two fellows on the track team, I'd already been kicked out <laughs> of school. Two friends asked if I would go to the uh, uh, March on Washington where Martin Luther King gave his famous speech. Mm. And I didn't really know what it was all about, but I said, sure. And I wound up. Uh, in D.C., we the three of us slept in a car <laughs> and uh, saw the event. And then 50 years later, 19, uh, what would that, what year was that? 63, uh, so 2013. 2013. 2013, I was invited to the White House as, as a commemoration of that original uh, march. And by that time, I've been involved a lot into politics, too, so. Yeah. There was a connection, and my wife had produced uh, lots of uh, political types in her uh, work at Emory University, and so it, it all fit. It all really fit. Excellent. Um, so soon after you married uh, Melrose, uh, you both had two children, mm -hmm. your son Kenneth Sprague uh, Jr. and your daughter Julie. That's uh, correct. Sixty-six. Was it at this point that you began uh, really getting into weightlifting and bodybuilding, like into competitions and things? Or was this something you were already doing earlier in your teens? <clears throat> uh, I was bodybuilding heavily uh, in my teens and weight, really lifting, uh, Olympic lifting, because I, I enjoyed it. I guess that's the best way to put it. I really enjoyed the activity. I enjoyed the socialization in the gym. Uh, it was for me. And I knew it was helping my athletics, no doubt about that. Mm. But uh, as I think one of the articles mentioned, I was trying to make the Olympic team in the shot. Yeah. Yeah. At that time, the, the uh, uh, marks weren't as high as they are now i think the world record at that time was 64 feet and i was early in college at 58 feet and i had aspirations yeah and it's ironic but the fellow that holds the world record now is from oregon in the united states oh there you go <laughs> trouser his name trouser he broke my youngest son's state record in the shot put <laughs> not his okay. way <laughs> There's all these coincidences. My yeah. youngest was a thrower because uh, he um, went to uh, went to the gym with me. He loved it, and that of course worked into the strength developed, worked into his success in the shot and the discus and all. Mm. Okay. Um, so you mentioned you you won the Mister Cincinnati in 1967. Was there any other titles you also won? Uh, when you were bodybuilding? No, I've only been in two contests, the 1967 Mr. Cincinnati, which the guys, the weight room at the Y was the best in town. They sort of pushed me into the contest. I don't think there was any fix in the judging, but who knows? Uh, and the second uh, contest, second and last contest, was the 1972 IFBB Mr. America. Yeah. I felt I felt I had to go because a lot of the gym members were heading to New York for the contest, and I felt I should be one of the guys since I owned the gym. Yeah, and I think I placed fourth there in tall class. I had only nice. trained for three weeks, not as an alibi, but uh, I wasn't that interested in competition for myself. Right. Still, I mean. You were amongst them, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> that's right. That's right. On the plane ride to and from, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> the tourists will never get over it, I'm sure. <laughs> so, I mean, um, 
you must have been pretty busy, like going back to your late teens now, having to support a family and study and work. I mean, can you explain how you managed all of this, uh, especially with the pressures of having a family and, again, segregation at the time? Yeah, it, it, it was difficult, but again, it's a matter of drive. You know, I, I wanted to do it. I wanted to make sure I could take care of my family. And so I was working 12 hours from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. in a machine shop. Mm. And then I had to be at class at 8 a.m. <laughs> and I had to be at track practice in the afternoon. I averaged maybe, including naps, three hours a day, you know, for the five days high school days oh man <laughs> so it uh, it was rough but uh, worked out worked out except it increased the friction be between my wife and I mm -hmm. uh, and coupled with the external pressures of, of uh, discrimination at that time it, it uh, took its toll yeah yeah um Oh God! So yeah, I mean, I can you just imagine. God, three-hour nights—I can't even imagine that. The the worst I've done was when I had kids working, training, everything, um, studying was uh, four to five hours. But I can't imagine three. <laughs> oh, I know. I can't either anymore. I don't know how I did it. I I remember times I would walk from class to the field house and maybe get a ten-minute rest and get back up and go to another class. But yeah, I know it, it's tough, but it's doable. I wouldn't recommend it. Hope, no. uh, hope none of our children ever have to do that. No, no, definitely not. So would you then say that that's what led to the divorce with your first wife? I think, yeah, I, a, a breakdown in communication, et cetera. She's a nice, she was a nice person. She's deceased. Oh. Uh, but, Sorry to uh, but she, uh, it just didn't, couldn't work in the two different worlds in one sense, based on uh, the discrimination at the time. From her upbringing, she felt that a factory job was a great job. If you can get a factory job, that's your highest goal. Mm. And I, of course, had other ideas. And, and not that that set it off, but it was just a difference in the way we each looked at life yeah and, yeah well i'm kind of getting this feeling now from you that i mean having read everything that you sent me and hearing even your own words that you had this drive um i can understand now a little bit about i guess you could say that you had this ambition as well when you were young and yeah i guess the decisions that you took um would reflect that would you say that's true I think so. I think so. I, a lot of it had to do with with having to make certain decisions. Mm -hmm. Not that those were the things I would naturally have liked to have been placed in front of me for a decision. But uh, there were some times when tough decisions had to be made. Yeah. I right, right after, for example, we were trying to um, uh, reconcile but couldn't. I out of desire to help, I signed everything over to her house, money, the whatnot. And there wasn't a lot at that time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I was sort of uh, living on a shoestring. Yeah. And I made it <laughs> for myself. <laughs> but uh, that's the decision I felt had to be made you know, for the kids in the long term and, and for her and I. So that was Ken Sprague, and as he explained, his family had much to do with his pursuit of sports at an early life. And not only did he excel in sports, but he was also a promising bodybuilder. I was rather surprised to, know, to learn from Ken that he got married so young, and further, the difficulties he faced during the time of segregation. The stresses of his life seemed to have mounted such that his life would lead him down to a path of desperation and cause him to make difficult decisions that would affect the rest of his life and of course we are talking about his decision to enter the modeling and gay porn industry which will be discussed in great detail in the next video interview. 
Later, still, we will explore how his interest in bodybuilding would persist and how he would turn his life around after his short stint in the gay porn industry and use the finances he gained to rescue Gold's Gym and create it into the mecca of bodybuilding. So I do hope you have enjoyed this video interview with Ken Sprague. And if you have, please give the video a like, subscribe and leave me your comments. That's it from me. This is the Golden Era Bookworm saying bye for now. Head to www.goldenerabookworm.com for the biggest range of classic old school bodybuilding books as ebooks, e-magazines such as Iron Man and Reg Park Journal, high quality bodybuilding posters of the Golden Era stars, merchandise and classic gym wear featuring Steve Reeves, Marvin Eder, John Grimmick, Reg Park and many other Golden Era stars. For those wishing to build a classic physique, lose fat and build muscle, online training is also available. Collectibles such as rare autographed photos from the Golden Era stars are also available and to collaborate, please get in touch. As a natural bodybuilder, it is imperative to know your own testosterone levels as they are a reflection of the anabolic environment created by your diet and training. I would highly recommend using the male hormone test kit from Let's Get Checked and make sure you use my code GOLDEN30 for a 30% discount. Again, the advantage of checking yourself regularly is that you will know how well your body is anabolically primed to put on the much desired muscle you are working for. Not all of us have the time to go to a gym or the opportunity to have a coach to teach us one-on-one -on -one. But with the Future Fitness app, it's like having a personal trainer in your living room. From February 11th onwards, you can try the Future Fitness app for only $19 for the first month. Think of what you can accomplish during that first month. So go on and hit my link at tryfuture.co slash geb to get started. Now, if you're interested in learning more about Vince Deronda's approach to bodybuilding, his principles, and all these tips of wisdom that he has. But to be honest, these three books, I believe, which I call the Classic Physique Bundle, are the best books that Vince ever came out with. And they, of course, are the Wild Physique, the Master Series, and the Pro Series. Have a look at it this way. The Wild Physique, I believe, is like the ABCs of Vince Deronda's principles to bodybuilding. He teaches you the exercises and his principles. But how do you put them together? Well, the Master Series is a 14-month program of using all of these principles, all of the diets that Vince came out with, all of the exercises. And of course, the Pro Series was a book that he came out with later on, specially targeted for uh, getting into competition. It's just the, these three books, as I call it, the Classic Physique Bundle, uh, Vince's best work, and available, of course, at www.goldenerabookum.com.